Hello everybody. Today I wanted to talk about whether insulin is altogether a bad player and do we truly understand what insulin resistance is? My disclosures are that I'm a part of the IDM with Jason Fung and Megan Ramos and a big proponent of how reducing meal frequency and intermittent and long-term fasting is good for us. The story of insulin resistance should start with Paul Langerhans. He was a student in 1860s who studied these tiny endocrine organs. In order to explain to you how tiny they are, most of the pancreas that is shown out here is an exocrine pancreas. What that means is that it's making digestive juices. Less than 2% of pancreas is endocrine pancreas that's assigned to make insulin, glucagon, somatostatin, and other hormones. So out here is shown the endocrine portion of the pancreas. These are called the islets. And if you take the entirety of the islets and put it in a teaspoon, it would be one quarter of a teaspoon, roughly about 1.5 grams. So your insulin making machinery is that small, yet that powerful. In another talk that I'm designing, I'm going to talk about the role of Dr. Roger Unger and how he defined the relationship between the insulin producing beta cells that are shown out here in this image in red and the glucagon producing alpha cells that are shown here in green because every insulin cell is juxtaposed with a glucagon producing cell. And the question that we have to ask is that is this juxtapositioning an accident of nature or does it have a physiologic significance? So please wait for the next uh, talk in which I will be discussing the parachronology between insulin and glucagon. And please subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon because it will give me more exposure. But for the purposes of this talk, I want to discuss whether insulin is a bad player. I do not think so. I think that we need to understand how to use insulin signaling better and need to understand what insulin resistance is. So in this slide, and the subsequent slides, I'm gonna show what insulin does in our body. So here is insulin and it works through the insulin receptor. And when insulin sits on the insulin receptor, it activates a series of chemical reactions. One of this reaction is that it mobilizes a channel called the GLUT4 pore. This GLUT4 pore goes to the surface of the cell and the role of that is to take in sugar into the cell. And let's suppose this is a liver cell. It takes the sugar in. The sugar is supposed to be stored for future use because our brain is almost entirely dependent on sugar. And it makes a storage form of sugar called glycogen. Some of that sugar can be burned in our mitochondria to generate fuel. Insulin signaling, insulin sitting on the receptor and insulin signaling is also important for our body to make new protein. One of the most health promoting activities that we can do is to have a large amount of lean muscle mass. Lean muscle mass is a carbohydrate dump. When we eat in carbs, that's a large reservoir. The muscles are a large reservoir and with appropriate insulin signaling and when somebody is insulin sensitive, you can absorb a large amount of glucose into your muscles and prevent it from accumulating in the bloodstream. More on that in a little bit. But the important point I want to recognize here is that insulin signaling through the insulin receptor 
activates a series of chemical reactions that makes our body make new protein. I have in my previous slide demonstrated how insulin signaling is important in storing fat and I'm not going to go into that during this presentation. But I want to talk about the importance of insulin signaling in our brain. Our brain is very rich in insulin receptors. And when insulin, which is shown here as a red circle, sits on the insulin receptor, it does a series of chemical reactions. And with these chemical reactions, it forms new protein that improves synaptic plasticity. Synaptic plasticity is a fancy way of saying that we are making new proteins so that the connection between brain cells is improved. Consequently, insulin signaling is a very important aspect of our brain function. To summarize this, insulin is released when we as humans eat a meal. And as Americans, we consume a meal that is very high in its carbohydrate content. For example, an average American may ingest about 250, even up to 300 plus grams of carbs. Our entire blood has less than a teaspoon of sugar in it, glucose. I sometimes conflate glucose and sugar together because it seems so easy to say sugar. If you drain the entire blood from my body, it'll be five liters, and you measure the amount of sugar in it, it'll be just about a teaspoon, five grams. Yet we eat up to 300 grams of carbohydrates. How does the body deal with preventing a significant surge in your sugar? The way it does that is that it sends signals to the pancreas saying that you better get ready and make insulin because this American has eaten a huge carbohydrate meal and a large amount of fat and protein in it and you better pack that sugar into the muscles, into the liver, that you take the amino acids and make new protein, and that you take the fat that this person has ingested and store it in the fat cells or let it be burned by the muscles. We also talked about the importance of insulin signaling in the brain. In my next presentation, I'm going to be talking about what glucagon does and how glucagon and insulin interact. But briefly, when you're not eating, the brain needs a constant supply of glucose, about six grams every hour. Glucagon is assigned that task because when you're not eating, what glucagon does is that it goes and tells the liver that let us use up the stored glucose is glycogen for the brain. If the glycogen is used up, the glucagon takes the glycerol from breakdown of fatty acids as well as breakdown of protein products called amino acids and through a process called gluconeogenesis converts it into sugar so that our brain is happy. If you continue to do what I recommend to do, which is to practice intermittent fasting, exercise, be on a low carb diet, the body starts to think that, hey, I don't want to burn protein to make sugar. So over a period of time, the protein breakdown is reduced because the body can now take the fatty acids and in the presence of glucagon, convert it into ketones and our brain can rely on that. So when you talk about the beta cell, alpha cell, or insulin glucagon interactions, what do they do is that insulin uses and stores carbs. It builds new protein. 
it packs fat into the fat cells and in the right setting lets the muscles burn fat for fuel. What does glucagon do? Glucagon is catabolic. It breaks down glycogen to make sugar. It breaks down protein to make glucose for the brain. And it breaks down fat to make glucose or ketones depending on your metabolic status. So we as Americans consume a large amount of refined carbs. And since we take refined carbs frequently and in large amounts, we persistently elevate our insulin. Is that the right thing to do? And what is insulin resistance? Up until about a few months ago, when I gave my presentation at Denver, I must say that I truly did not understand what insulin resistance was. So here is the normal pancreas. Um, the amount of beta cells and alpha cells are uh, normal. This is a person persistently and frequently consuming a large amount of refined carbs. And what they do is that they hypertrophy their beta cells. So the initial stimulus for anybody getting obese is beta cell hypertrophy because you are called on to make more insulin. The beta cells become larger and increase in number. Now you can see that very clearly in many, many studies. And this is one very good example. If you take an obese person and a lean person and you measure the amount of insulin that they are making over a 24 hour period, you can see that the obese individual makes a lot more insulin by several orders of magnitude, by several orders of magnitude compared to a lean person. So an obese individual is making a lot of insulin. They are hyperinsulinemic. Is that a problem? Now the paradigm that I understood before and what I told my patients was essentially slightly wrong. And this is the paradigm in which the cell is stuffed with sugar or glucose. And there is a lot of sugar in the circulation and insulin is, caused, is called upon to stuff more sugar into the cell. And that's the paradigm I believed and I think I was wrong. I even took this example of the Japanese train. Japanese train during rush hour is filled up. And in order to clear the platform, there are Japanese train police who take people who are standing on the platform and shove them in so that they can clear the platform and move the traffic. It's, it's a, a good, good metaphor. metaphor. But insulin resistance is actually a situation in which the cell is starved. There is not as much sugar inside it or glucose. And the reason it is not there is because of defective signaling of the insulin receptor. The way I explain it best is like this. When somebody is given an opioid drug, the first time the opioid drug is given, they have a significant euphoric and pain relief reaction. But as the drug is continued, the intensity of pain relief and the euphoria goes down. The reason it goes down is because there is down regulation of opioid receptors. Similarly, the analogy of hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance is a cart versus the horse example. The horse is the hyperinsulinemia. The cart is the insulin resistance. And I want to explain to you how this happens. Too much insulin is down-regulating the insulin receptor and messing up insulin signaling. Persistent and repeated ingestion of refined carbs and even in individuals eating refined protein because protein also elicits a significant insulin response 
the activation of intracellular mechanisms like mobilization of the GLUT4 channel, activation for making new protein is blocked. In other words, it gets downregulated. So even though insulin is sitting on the insulin receptor, the intracellular signaling that is necessary for insulin action is blocked. I'm showing that here as a cartoon. So insulin is sitting here, and because it's sitting there, it's making these uh, glucose to come in. But over a period of time, the intracellular signaling is blocked, and insulin is degraded by insulin-degrading enzymes. And it takes time for insulin signaling to recover. So that is the importance of reducing your meal frequency. That is the importance of doing intermittent fasting because it takes time for the insulin receptor to rehabilitate itself. There is also what is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. What that means is that once insulin sits on the insulin receptor, the receptor is taken inside and no longer available for insulin action. And in certain situations of persisted and repeated insults, the receptor may not only be endocytosed, but then fused with the garbage disposal mechanism called lysosome and subsequently destroyed. So here is a cartoon that is talking about receptor endocytosis. The receptor, once the insulin sits on it, is taken in, it's endocytosed, and then recycle back. So this recycling of receptor takes time. How can you make that happen better? You can make it happen better by practicing reduced meal frequency and fasting. I think as humans, we were never designed to consume food all the time. There were supposed to be periods in which we didn't have food, in which we had to search for our food. Similarly, there is downregulation and endocytosis of the insulin receptor inside the brain and persistent hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance is a very strong cause of dementia because it alters the ability of our brain to make connection between cells. This is, as we described, a synaptic plasticity. And when insulin receptor gets downregulated, the brain becomes incapable of dealing with beta amyloid, which is a toxic protein that causes neuronal cell death. So that's why the brain of people with Alzheimer's and dementia is smaller in size, and the proximate cause of that is insulin resistance. So I'd like to submit to you that hyperinsulinemia in modern society is the proximate cause of insulin resistance, that a diet that is high in refined carbohydrates, and even people like us who are low-carb advo advocates can make errors by eating repeatedly protein meals because protein also stimulates insulin, and I will show that in a subsequent talk, that high insulin levels alter insulin receptor signaling. In one of my talks, I'm going to talk about how you can improve insulin signaling by exercise. High insulin levels cause receptor endocytosis. Sometimes the degradation of these receptors in the lysosomes, that they reduce brain insulin signaling and promote uh, receptor endocytosis, making us less intelligent and that's not a good thing. So I thought to keep this video short, I would focus on what insulin resistance is, and I'd like to submit that insulin is not a bad player. We should just learn how to use it properly, how to let the insulin receptor recover, and if we use insulin properly, our brain insulin signaling will be better and we'll all be better off. Thank you.